Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing acetylcholinesterase enzymes and also acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Okay, so we are now discussing covalent uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and uh, we are discussing physostigmine to treat glaucoma. So I'm going to explain to you what glaucoma is. So glaucoma is a uh, disease involving the eye. So let me show you the structure of an eye. So basically what we're going to do is take a cross section, a transverse cross section of an eye. So if this is someone's head here, okay, then they have two eyes, one here and one here. What we're going to do effectively is take a plane through the eyes like that. Well, imagine chopping off the top of their heads and then looking down into the eye. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So the structure of the eye looks like this, and I'll do this in a lot of color. So we'll draw the retina first. We'll start with the retina here. So here is the retina, and I will color the retina in in red to give it some thickness rather than just having a little line here. Okay, so in red here, this is the retina. So this is the portion of the eye that's involved in actually uh, sensing the uh, light. Okay, so this is the retina. Then at the front, what you have is a sort of large piece of muscle here. Okay, known as the ciliary body, and this is also involved in secreting a fluid. So this is the ciliary body. Okay, and this is sort of confluent with the uh, retina. So we'll have the ciliary body also in red here. Okay, and then suspended from the ciliary body, you have a number of suspensory ligaments, okay, which are holding onto the lens which sits in the middle here. So here is the lens, okay, and I'll just repair up the suspensory ligaments. So let me label up all of these things. So these, uh, which are clinging on to the lens, are the suspensory ligaments, okay? And then what they're holding in the middle there is the lens, and the lens is responsible for focusing the light. Okay, so this is the lens, right. Now, in front of the lens, what you then have is the iris coming in here. So these are these pieces of muscle known as the iris coming in from both sides. Now, of course, we're taking a cross section. The iris is actually a circular piece of muscle that lo looks like an annulus. So it looks, in reality, like this. This is the colored bit that you see from the outside with the pupil in the middle. Okay, but we're only taking a cross section of this, so we're effectively seeing this portion and this portion with the hole in the middle. So this is the pupil in the middle, and this is the iris. So we'll give them blue eyes, shall we? So we'll cover the iris muscle in blue. Okay, so here's the iris. Right, then what you have Behind the retina now, we'll start with behind the retina, you have another layer, okay? Well, actually, I should draw something more on, on before. Here comes the optic nerve off here, so this will relay the information to the brain. So this here that I've drawn is the right eye, since the optic nerve is going to the left. So it's going to go in through uh, the optic uh, canal into the brain. So this is the optic nerve. Okay, or cranial nerve 2, if you like. Cranial nerve CN2. Right, and then behind the retina, what you then have is the choroid, which I'll show in orange. Okay, so this is a layer that's behind the retina. Okay, like this, and it sort of goes to that level there, maybe. Okay, so this is the choroid, or choroid. And then Covering the whole thing now is the sclera, uh, is the sclera, which is the cornea at the front. So we'll do this in yellow. So covering absolutely everything, you have this structure at the front, which is called the sclera, uh, not the sclera, the cornea at the front. But then it sort of continues all the way around the eye, and at the back of the eye, it's called the cornea. Sorry, not the cornea. Oh dear, it's called the sclera. At the front, okay, I've made a real pig's ear of this. So, at the front 
it's called the cornea. At this portion that's over the iris here, this is the cornea, okay? And then this portion that isn't over the iris, this is the sclera. So, the white of the eye, so when you're looking at someone's eye, okay, so let's say this is someone's eye here, then you see the iris and the pupil at the center. So here's the iris, here's the pupil. And then over the iris and the pupil, there is this cornea here. And then round the outside, there is the white of the eye. And this basically is the sclera, but it's the continuation of the uh, cornea, which was over the iris, basically. Okay, so that's a nice sort of cross-section of the um, eye then. So, the question is, are these two cavities, one that you've got here and one which you've got here, are they empty or are they full of liquid? And the answer is that the, this one here is full of liquid. So this has the, what's known as the aqueous humor in. Okay, so this is the aqueous humor. Okay, and uh, this behind, this bigger cavity back here, this has a sort of gloop in it. If you've ever done dissection of the eye, you, you will know what this is. Basically, when you cut open the eye, a huge, great mass, a sort of gelatinous, kind of jelly-like, uh, translucent, or well, more transparent, actually, transparent gloop comes out. And this sort of semi-solid gloop that is sitting in this cavity is what's known as the vitreous body. Okay, so it's a... It, imagine a uh, transparent piece of jelly that's moulded into the shape of this cavity. That's what the vitreous body is. Okay, whereas the uh, fluid... Well, the structure, the substance which fills this anterior chamber here, this is um, more a liquid, basically. Now, this aqueous humor here, this is produced by the ciliary body here. Okay, so the ciliary body is producing the aqueous humor. Now, what happens in glauco uh, glaucoma is that this fluid starts to build up and the pressure within this anterior chamber of the eye becomes higher and higher and higher. So it's basically like uh, a balloon which you are filling with more and more fluid and what's going to eventually happen if you keep doing this uh, it's going to um, burst so that doesn't quite happen but it causes blindness basically so gla glaucoma, glaucoma is too high pressure in, in the aqueous humor now what causes it well basically there is a um, there has to be a way of removing the fluid if the ciliary body is continuously producing the fluid and putting it into this anterior chamber, there needs to be a way of removing it, okay? And the ears, right in this corner here, and also in this corner, there is a little drainage system known as the Canal of Schlem, which is draining the fluid out of uh, this anterior portion of uh, the eye, okay? So it is draining the aqueous humor out. Now, if this um, canal of Schlem becomes blocked, okay, uh, and the way that you can actually end up blocking it is if the cornea here ends up too tightly opposed to the iris here, then just fluid simply cannot get out, okay? So, that would cause fluid to build up in this anterior chamber of the eye and cause raised uh, intraocular pressure, okay? So, uh, that's what happens in glaucoma. So, what do we need to do to treat it? Well, we need to open up this passageway to the canal of Schlems. And the way that you do that is by contracting uh, this ciliary body here, okay? So, if you contract the ciliary body, the effect effect that it actually has is to pull the iris backwards, basically. So I haven't really drawn it quite as it should be. Basically, this is more like a structure that sort of has this shape rather than the shape I've drawn it. So it's more like this. And it connects to the iris as well. And if you contract the ciliary body, also known as the ciliaris muscle, so this is also called the ciliaris muscle, 
if you contract the ciliary body, then what ends up happening is you pull the iris back and you open up this pathway leading to the canal of Schlem that is round the edge of the iris here. Okay, and that leads to increased drainage of uh, the um, anterior chamber of the eye. Okay, so how do you activate the ciliary body to contract? Well, basically, the muscle cells of this ciliary body have on their uh, surface M3 acetylcholine receptors, so M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So this time, not a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, instead a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. So a GQ, G protein coupled receptor. So this, when you activate this M3 receptor with acetylcholine, it will cause the contraction of uh, the ciliary body, basically, and the pulling back of the iris, and therefore the opening of this passageway to the canal of Schlem, so that the aqueous humor can drain and lower the pressure in this anterior chamber. Okay, so uh, what then? Uh, how then can we actually activate this M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor? Well, one way will be to increase the stimulation that is occurring endogenously. So there are nerves which are releasing acetylcholine onto the ciliary body. So if we could just amplify that acetylcholine signal, for instance, by inhibiting the acetylcholinesterase enzymes that will be in the neuromuscular junctions here, okay, then uh, we could... Um, increase the contraction of this ciliary body and pull the iris back. So that is what physostigmine is used for. You um, give it topically, so you give it in eye drops that are administered onto the eye, and then it will cause um, the inhibition of the acetylcholinesterase enzymes in these neuromuscular junctions between the ciliary body muscle cells and uh, the nerves, innervating them. And that will mean that when the nerves release acetylcholine, that acetylcholine uh, that they release is hugely potentiated. The signal will be huge, whereas it would usually be much smaller. And this will cause a large contraction of the ciliary body, uh, leading to the pulling back of the iris and the opening of this passageway that leads to the canal of Schlem. And therefore, you'll drain the aqueous humor out. Okay, right. So that's glaucoma and how we can use acetylcholinesterase inhibitors to um, treat it. Okay, so one final little class of drugs then, the irreversible inhibitors of the acetylcholinesterase enzymes. So there are two of these which I think you should know the names of. One is known as Diflos, okay, and the other is known as Malathion, okay. Now, both of these drugs, again, are going to bind to this serine hydroxyl group at position 209, and this time it can't be removed. The body has no way of removing these drugs from uh, the alcohol group of serine for free, uh, 203. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, once these drugs have been administered and they've inhibited the acetylcholinesterase enzyme, that's it. That acetylcholinesterase enzyme will never be repaired endogenously by the body. There is actually a drug which can remove these sort of dr drugs from uh, the serine 203 uh, of the acetylcholinesterases, and that's known as praladoxine. So praladoxine is actually capable of removing uh, these drugs. Okay, but the body has no way of actually removing them from uh, the acetylcholinesterase once they've gone in. Okay, now, what are they used to treat? Well, Diflos is used to treat glaucoma again because it will inhibit the acetylcholinesterase enzymes in those neuromuscular junctions between the neurons and the um, uh, muscle cells of the ciliary body. And therefore, the acetylcholine signals that you get occurring between those neurons and the muscle cells of the ciliary body will be much greater than usual, and that will stimulate over-contraction of the uh, cells of the ciliary body, leading to the pulling back of the iris, and therefore the opening of the passageway to canal of Schlem, and the drainage, drainage of the anterior chamber of the eye. Malathion is actually used as a... Um, um, an anti-parasitic. It's used to kill head vice. So we put it in um, 
shampoo that's specifically against head lice and what it does is it will go into the head lice and it will cause overstimulation of uh, the muscles of those head lice so it will block the acetylcholinesterase enzymes in the neuromuscular junctions of the head lice permanently okay so these acetylcholinesterase enzymes are permanently blocked so, when uh, the neurons of the, at those neuromuscular junctions release acetylcholine, the acetylcholine will just continue to stimulate the muscle cells of the, um, of the head lice continuously, okay? So, you'll get continuous stimulation of these muscle cells, and you won't be able to terminate the signal ever, because the acetylcholinesterases are just permanently inhibited. So, what it will actually cause is spastic paralysis of these uh, head lice because all their muscles will just be contracted continuously and they won't be able to have any control over their muscles basically. Uh, so it's kind of like tetanus where you get spastic paralysis. The same thing will happen to the head lice and that will kill them. Okay, so uh, that is acetylcholinesterases, the inhibitors, and we've looked at three conditions which they can be used to treat, myasthenia gravis, uh, glaucoma, and also uh, Alzheimer's disease, and then if you want to count head lice as the fourth, uh, you're free to do so.